Thanks for attending. Everybody sure he or she wants to stay? Okay. Everybody is sure, so we can, sh we can start. As you all know, the history of neutrino physics starts with the famous letter of Wolfgang Pauli to the Tübingen Conference in 1930. Amusingly, he concludes by apologizing his absence because, as he said, he had to go to a dance in Zurich. In general, Pauli was very skeptical. He used to be blunt, sharp, mocking, and sometimes even brutal. And I think it's worth remembering that aspect of scientific debate represented by Pauli. And for that reason, I'm going to read you a fictitious letter by Wolfgang Pauli. Dear radioactive ladies and gentlemen in Hamburg 2016, I'd like to tell you a few words how about I postulated the neutrino. There were experiments by Ellis and Wooster concerning the missing energy in beta decay, but I just could not believe them. I wrote, I believe that the experimenters are cheating somehow and failed to see the gamma rays due to their ineptitude. Eventually, Lisa Meitner convinced me that the energy was really missing. That's how the idea of a new particle was born, and one week after my divorce, I wrote that letter. At that time, Niels Bohr came up with the idea that energy conservation might be violated, but I didn't like that kind of reasoning at all. I wrote to Oskar Klein, his assistant, as usual, you are fighting like a lion for Bohr's idea before you have even understood it, but this doesn't impress me. Of course, the neutrino hypothesis does not fit in your stuff, but for that very reason I particularly enjoy discussing it with you Boreans. If I take a look at the present state of neutrino physics, it seems to me that you don't realize that my proposal was a sign of desperation rather than discovery. You seem to admire my ingenuity, but people back then were ridiculing the idea because it seemed a cheap explanation that fixed the energy balance, an excuse everybody could have cooked up. Indeed, soon after, I had some doubts. I have done a terrible thing. I replaced something that could not be understood with something that could not be observed. Now, I know that all of you will tell me about the numerous experiments and not only claim to have observed neutrinos, but also several sorts of them, in addition to the usual electron neutrinos, muon neutrinos, and tau neutrinos, and new proposals seem to be underway. Additionally, it seems that they, the different species may transform somehow into each other. <coughs> Had I proposed these things in 1930, people would have declared me nuts. And I still can understand this pretty well. How could you be sure instead that I like to be the prophet for all these particles? I never testified that my desperate proposal back then should be a blueprint for an endless series of particles invented to justify poorly understood experiments. You call these discoveries, but where does the whole enterprise lead us? Have any of you thought about this? In the next century, will there be conferences about the 7th and 8th neutrino flavors with 28 parallel sessions about the respective mix mixing angles? Does such a conference make sense in your opinion? Does this conference today make sense? What you are doing today is not the same science we used to call physics. It's a blend of high-tech and theoretical bean counting. Back then, we were debating the deep riddles of nature. We were concerned about fundamental problems such as electron self-energy, just to give an example. I said, this was, probably, this was probably something for the next generation to solve. 
you're the second and third generation now, but it seems to me that you have even forgotten to recognize the problem. Einstein did. I disagreed with him on many topics, but as I said, Einstein had a feeling for the central order of things. He was convinced that the laws of nature had to be simple. He would certainly be even more upset than me about the current state of affairs. Physics is about understanding, not just describing. And it's certainly not just about collecting Nobel Prizes. What's the ultimate goal of your research field? Building detectors of ever-increasing size and cost and getting a 1 in 10 quota of Nobel Prizes for discoveries of which none are really fundamental? Now many of you will say that nature is like that and we have to accept that and do further experiments, that's it. I remember the telegram I received from Cohen and Ryans when they announced their neutrino discovery in 1956. <laughs> they were lucky that I wasn't present in their lab to destroy the results with my Pauli effect. But seriously, the ensuing merger of big science, big money and big military wasn't the same development. It seems that people found by brute force the things they had decided to find. Liederman, in his 1963 experiment, handpicked 29 events out of hundreds of trillions, concluding that the moon neutrino was the most likely interpretation, without giving cogent reasons for choosing 25 days within a period of eight months, throwing away 20, uh, 2,500 out of 5,000 pictures because they were black, and sorting out another 400 for cosmic radiation. The problem is, and I failed to recognize this in 1930, that an established result will never be retracted, however questionable the evidence may be. Don't tell me that later experiments constitute an independent test. The more flavors and parameters you have at disposal, the easier it becomes to describe any results in these terms. One of the few reflective voices in your field, Emilio Segre, said, recently a third lepton, Tau, has been discovered. Is this supposed to be just the beginning of a finite or even infinite series of leptons? With all your busy bustling in your underground labs, I miss such a voice of reason that reminds me of the philosophical tradition that I consider an element of physics. We wanted to understand how nature worked, not just measure the decimals of mixing angles. By the way, I believe that the rest mass of the neutrino was either zero or in the range of the electron mass. These experiments involve impressive technology, but again I ask myself where th this enterprise is going to end up. Building better machines, sensitive enough for smaller and smaller masses, with an ever-increasing probability of false alarm detection. I also think that you're not as critical toward experimental claims as our generation was. I believe you are severely underestimating the fact that the more background remove, the higher the probability of a misinterpretation. You try to remove background, but there is always something left. More seriously, the overwhelming part of the evidence involved in the interpretation of missing signals, that is, seeing by not seeing. Thus, however impressive your technology may be, and however careful you try to be, I believe that you are fooling yourselves. You are fooling yourselves about the existence of a plethora of particles postulated for no more reason than describing an increasingly complicated model in which signals continue to miss. I'm sorry that I missed the chance to know a certain Thomas Kuhn, who appears to be a smart guy. I wonder if any of you have read his book about scientific revolutions, since post-war neutrino physics is a textbook example of a paradigm running into a crisis. This is a story of epicycles, a story of anomaly and complication, an unmistakable sign of the sickness of a physical theory. If there is an ongoing crisis, established results are never reverted until the entire building collapses. The whole process is definitely a matter of consensus and agreement, and you may also call it groupthink. People agree because they don't like to throw away the results in which they have invested so much. You are victim to the sunk cost fallacy, and you don't realize how much of what you seem to know 
is actually merely belief. And the more people there are in the community, and the more money there is at stake, the easier it becomes to delegate thinking to the crowd. When we met at the 1927 Solvay conference, everyone struggled with everyone else. From listening to your plenary talks, these meetings have taken the role of religious celebrations. If you ask me how I'm currently feeling as the grandfather of the Neutrino family, I almost regret that I discouraged Bohr from pursuing his idea of violation of energy conservation back then. He conjectured that nuclear physics needed another revolution, like quantum mechanics was a revolution for atomic physics. Back then, the majority of physicists, including me, believed that relinquishing energy conservation was suicide for physics. However, what I have seen since then is heading towards intellectual agony. For that reason, I hope you will excuse my absence from this meeting. I am going to attend another dance. <laughs>